Welcome to the College of Education and Human Ecology's webinar on educational leadership. The second in a series of three webinars being hosted by our college this winter. I am Nicole Luthi, Chief of Staff and Director of Strategic Operations for the college. School leadership is, an, is a challenging role and the college has historically partnered with thought leaders and school administrators to address the critical issues of the day. In recent years, the superintendents and residents of the college have organized well-attended opportunities for the exchange of important ideas. This year, they have created the series of three virtual panel discussions for K-12 educational leaders and other decision makers in the educational space. In today's webinar, we'll focus on social and emotional support for students during the pandemic. Specifically, we'll examine some of the unique challenges exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and the impact on students' social and emotional well-being. Today's webinar will be hosted by Dr. Marie Ward. Marie is a superintendent of Fairfield County Educational Service Center. She's also an alumna of our college, college and one of three superintendents in residence. The Superintendents in Residence is a three-year fellowship program bringing together Ohio superintendents from urban, rural, and suburban school districts to share knowledge with the college, develop active research agendas, and share learning that benefits school communities. Marie, welcome, and thank you for leading this important discussion. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, I'd like to welcome our esteemed panelists for today. Joining our discussion are three outstanding leaders in their field, all of whom focus on social and emotional support for adolescents. Jonathan Dalton is a licensed psychologist, public speaker and author who founded the Center for Anxiety and Behavioral Change in Rockville, Maryland. The center is a private treatment facility dedicated to using evidence-based treatment for patients with anxiety disorders. Jonathan specializes in the treatment of anxiety disorders in children and adolescents with a particular focus on anxiety-based school refusal. He frequently consults with school systems across the country, provides training to other mental health professionals and presents to community organizations. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, next, we have Missy McLean. She's a graduate of Kent State University and is a coordinator of the Community Education Program in the Department of School Health Services at Akron Children's Hospital. Over the past 15 years, Missy has had the privilege to travel, train, collaborate with, and learn from thousands of students, school staff, and community leaders all over Ohio. She utilizes a mix of personal experiences and lessons from the road to bring practical resources to any adult looking to make a difference in the life of a child. Missy, thank you for joining us today. Good morning, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. And finally, Sarah Ward, we are not related, uh, <laughs> holds a certificate of clinical competence in speech language pathology and has more than 25 years of experience in the treatment of executive dysfunction. She is an internationally recognized expert on executive function and leads seminars on the programs and strategies she has developed with her co-director, Kristen Jacobson, at the Cognitive Connections located in Concord, Massachusetts. Their 360 Thinking Executive Function Program received the Innovative Promising Practices Award from the National Organization of Children and Adults with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Sarah, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here this morning. Today's webinar will begin with a panel discussion. Then we'll take questions from the audience. Please feel free to post your questions in the Q&A uh, at any time. We'll do our best to answer as many as possible. So again, thank you for joining us. All righty. What I'd like to do is really engage in a conversation around some questions that I've crafted that focus on this topic. 
Um, I'd love for you to begin by sharing uh, how you've helped children in schools struggling with SEL as a result of the pandemic. Sure, I'll go ahead and uh, dive on in. Um, I would definitely say things have changed. Um, I used to provide a lot of professional development on executive function in schools to students. And now, of course, that's moved quite a bit to virtual as well as um, used to provide a lot of in-person one-to-one executive function based coaching. And that's certainly shifted a lot to telepractice, which means we've had to support both teachers as well as students and other speech and language pathologists in learning how to provide online support for a lot of executive function and social emotional based skills. Um, I'm a speech and language pathologist. So certainly there was a lot of challenge in working on social skills um, virtually. That was a, a big challenge, um, but also really having to develop students executive function skills where in school, there were a lot of times where students might not qualify for a 504 or an IEP and yet be struggling with executive function. and teachers that are just naturally good educators would be sort of uh, supporting students in the classroom with uh, cueing and prompting and reminders. And then when things went virtual, all of a sudden students were home and they didn't have that scaffolded support. And we saw a lot of executive function skills really tanking. Um, so I think that that's been a, a big shift in supporting students and being able to improve their organization and planning and time management. And when students had to return to school in the fall, where they had been used to rolling out of bed and just flipping on the computer, now they had to re-engage that routine and plan their time and get themselves dressed and uh, manage being able to get a ride to school or being able to be to the bus on time. And so I think that that was, again, another shift and adjustment for a lot of our students. Well, I'll oh. go next. Um, <laughs> so uh, my work, I have been in the schools working really with teachers primarily over the last, um, I would say, 10 years, specifically working on working uh, social and emotional learning into their ordinary everyday routine activity and curricula and how we can make it an everyday universal practice for every child who walks into the building. And so, um, of course, uh, just as Sarah said, things had changed, uh, have changed through the pandemic. And we uh, were really running some of those sessions more in Zoom. I wasn't able to quite get into the schools in the way that I used to be able to with, uh, you know, I used to be able to go do observations and be able to um, consult with teachers on um, universal strategies. But um, as students began coming back into schools, it was as important as ever to really begin thinking about social and emotional learning as a general practice all the time, that it's not just something for our specialty staff, but it's something for uh, everyone to really be engaging with. And it's gonna be good for every child. Um, even if the child's not um, struggling with extra stress right now, they are still benefiting from the extra social and emotional work, but it's gonna be especially helpful for the kiddos who may be having a harder time coming back. So um, so yeah, it's been uh, it's been an exciting and, and strange time. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, so I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist and I specialize in treating anxiety disorders. And what makes anxiety disorders disordered is that the fear is real, but the danger is not. Um, and in this situation, things have really shifted because there is danger present. Um, there are things that are going on right now. And so what in my work with school systems and with individual schools, a big part of my shift has gotten away from consulting with how do we work with the kids who just have anxiety disorders, maybe having a hard time making it into the school building or staying in the classroom, and more into how do we disseminate core competencies and coping skills to the entire student body? How, how do we build up these skills before they even know that they need them? Um, and so it's more of treating non-disordered but still impairing anxiety. Um, and then, of course, we've all been aware that the, the gap has widened between the haves and have nots educationally. So the 504 and the IEP kids have gotten much further behind during the distance learning hybrid, all of those things. And so we're seeing a lot of secondary anxiety because they don't feel competent in what they're doing. 
they're starting to um, see themselves as, as less than their peers academically, and they're changing their, their own perception of their abilities in those ways. So working with them to better contextualize the challenges and seeing it as more situationally driven than character logically maintained. Um, so those are, are big things. And of course, in my practice, working with anxiety disorders, um, we are seeing um, COVID-related stress permeating every aspect of the kids that we're working with. So, so this school year, and I can say this from firsthand experience with the, the programs and the services that we offer through the Educational Service Center, we are seeing more and more children exhibiting social, emotional, and behavioral challenges. What would you uh, say would be the top three strategies you would recommend schools implement to help children to better regulate their emotions and behavior? I'll go first. Um, so this is something that I think is vitally important as schools that we need to start making a, um, a, a number one priority. I know that we are very taxed academically, but I think that creating a social and emotional safety space is how we're actually going to um, uh, bridge some of those gaps that Jonathan was talking about um, and the others that he didn't talk about. But I think if I were to pick three top things, the first First thing would be um, every day, all day, deep breathing. I think if I could pick one thing that schools would be doing, it would be that everybody, the teachers, the principals, the superintendents, the students, that we are doing all day, every day, deep breathing. Um, uh, and on top of that, really looking at uh, just basic emotional literacy reporting. So I know lots of schools are doing things like zones of regulation um, and other ways of, of being able to begin talking about emotion. But I don't care if the kid's five years old or 17 years old, um, there are more emotional words for him to learn. Um, and I think the more um, language a child has, the better they are able to cope. And um, so that was that was all one. Two, strategy two <laughs> would be um, the use of um, circles and other types of um, community building work. I think that more than ever, our students need to feel connected with one another and with the adults in the building. And and so um, not only does uh, really committing some extra time to circle building, um, not only does it improve the lives and well-being of the children in the room, but it improves the um, overall work satisfaction for the adults in the room as well. Um, so giving really teachers the opportunity, the permission, um, and, uh, and the support to be able to run uh, things like circles to build these positive relationships with kids and allow them to build them together. The third thing is um, incorporating more student voice and choice, allowing kids to uh, be able to talk about what their needs are, uh, both academically and socially and emotionally, um, and giving them um, choice in uh, really what types of things that they participate in, what types of things that they are committed to. I think that would be a really great start. So every day, emotional literacy, deep breathing, the use of circles or other types of relationship and community building activities and student voice and choice. Those are my three. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll jump in next to, to piggyback off of what Missy was saying. Um, the more I do this work, and I've been doing it for a long time, I come back to that word connectedness. Um, I, I think it's foundational. And the research shows that it is the best source of resilience that we can find is the perception of social support among peers, among um, people, adults in their lives. And so the more we can foster and facilitate that sense of connectedness, the more we're gonna be crafting this lifeboat in the storm that these kids are all in right now. I think that's really important. In addition to that, um, going back to the idea of curricula building. Um, so like I've been working with school systems to develop just a three session taught by school counselors curriculum about how to cope, um, you know, what is the role of avoidance, how and, and avoidance and fear are teammates and, um, and how do we not believe everything that we think? Um, how do we be anxious and, and fill in the blank? Like I had a, a girl a before the pandemic who missed two years of school and she was kind of a meek teenager. And I asked her to fill in the blank in the sentence that I can be anxious and blank at the same time. And she thought about it for a few minutes and got the stern look on her face, which was unusual. And I thought something was wrong. And she leaned in and she said, I can be anxious and strong at the same time. And she was. And she got back into school the next week and stayed in and graduated on time. Um, and so that kind of curriculum building, kind of the owner's manual for your nervous system, 
um, to be given to all of the kids. I think it's really, really important. And the third I know is aspirational, but it's funding more mental health care in the school system. Um, we know that across the country, 75% of all child mental health care is delivered in a school setting. And right now we have a higher need for that than we've ever had before. I know in our practice, we usually get through our waiting list by the end of August, we kind of pivot for the new school year. This year going into September, we had 250 families on our waiting list. And so, and that's not just us, people like us are all over the country are experiencing the same thing. So curriculum being delivered to every school, um, even if it's three sessions, um, facilitating connectedness and really working to get more mental health um, professionals in the school building um, so their caseloads are lower would be fantastic. Yeah, I have um, I have a little bit of a, a, a different perspective too on that um, executive function relationship with social emotional learning. So um, executive function is sort of interesting in the sense that uh, we often think of it as being that organizational kind of pack your backpack, record your homework, turn your homework in. But uh, for example, all of you are maybe listening to this webinar, but I guarantee you have a little movie going through your head. And I'm a speech pathologist, so I always have props, right? So we always have that thought bubble. But that movie through your head says, oh, okay, as soon as the webinar is over, I'm going to run into the laundry room and throw the wash into the dryer. I'm going to walk the dog. And then as soon as I get back, I've got to review those three emails and prep that report so that the minute you hang up with the webinar, you're headed right for the laundry room. That prospective forethought and ability to visualize yourself moving through space and time and planning is naturally taught in schools when a teacher gives a directive. So when a teacher says, okay, class, go get your whiteboard and a dry erase marker and come back to your desk, or the high school student who's sitting in class and says, oh, okay, Spanish is about to end. I need to go down the hall, up the stairs to calculus. I need to remember to return in, you know, turn in that assignment. And then I've got to make sure I take that check over to the athletic department to turn in something. What happened in the pandemic was that we didn't want kids sharing materials. We didn't want kids, you know, with physical and social distancing, we didn't want them lining up and walking down to music. So the music teacher came into the class and we gave students materials that they didn't share. So what happened is all of a sudden students were no longer practicing this skill of mm -hmm. forethought and being able to transition. And so one of my big goals is, is that I think it's really critical as a strategy that educators are working with students on building forethought, having them really pre-imagine their plan and envision, okay, where am I now and where am I going? What time do I need to be there? If I'm in this location now, what future space do I see myself in and what objects do I need? We have to reteach that forethought. And that really also comes from situational awareness, which is the ability to read a room and being able to say, okay, where am I and what's going on and what social emotional cues can I use that trigger for me? Oh, everyone else is turning in homework. I should turn in homework too. We found that in the remote learning, kids no longer had that shared environment to read the room to guide their thinking and planning. So my strategy number two would be really working with students to re-engage in reading a room, being able to sort of see what's happening around them, being able to cue into time, being able to cue into the materials that they need. Um, and then related to that third one with time, when students are learning online, as we know, there's no stop spot. So what happens is all of a sudden they're losing track of time. And so their ability to sort of um, understand how long should something take if I'm not multitasking and to be able to self-regulate. So really pulling in a lot of time management strategies and our biggest time management strategies in classrooms and that we teach parents is super simple of re making sure students are using analog clocks and having analog clocks in learning environments and analog clock dry erase marker and actually showing the real sweep of time. We really encourage teachers to have students see, okay, you know, we've got 15 minutes to work on that, or I'm going to spend 15 minutes. My, of course, my dry erase marker is dying out, but um, that ability to see and plan time 
um, has really escaped a lot of our students that are learning virtually. So again, there's my uh, better uh, marker, but being able to really see how time is passing and how much time do I have left. Um, I think those improve that emotional regulation and executive planning. Well, Sarah, you really helped lead to the next question that I was gonna ask you all, which is um, AS schools work with families and, and parents with their critical partners in helping with the development of children. Do you have some ideas or some strategies that you would recommend educators use to help engage parents and families in this process and some strategies that they might use at home to support their children? Sure, I'll, I'll give one quick one and then I'll uh, shift away. So remember how important forethought is that you're able to visualize um, and you're able to visualize yourself in a future space. So if I'm eating breakfast, what will I look like upstairs when I'm getting dressed for school and following my routine? So parents can draw on a clock. But the other thing is, is that we actually find um, a lot of times if a parent says, okay, you need to be dressed and out the door by you know, 7.30. The parent has an image in mind of that means the student has on their hat and their backpack and their homework in hand. Taking a photograph is one of the easiest ways that parents can do that so that students and parents have a shared image of what ready actually looks like. And we find the photograph is 90% far more effective than the checklist because kids can read a checklist, but they may not actually visualize that future imagery. So photographs are a great way. I mean, if you're going to say to a student, okay, you need to, um, you know, carry out a specific task, uh, whether it's like the recycling or cleaning a bedroom, uh, even just being able to get a photograph of what the recycling looks like when it's all at the end of the driveway, or what does the bedroom look like when it's clean, can support students in developing that backwards plan and that self-directed talk. Um, I, I can, I, I, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so, so parents are are absolutely critical, and um, when it comes to anxiety, which I'll be focusing in on, um, we know that working with parents and helping them to be less complicit with the use of avoidance as a means of coping is highly effective in reducing anxiety among kids. So, number one is giving parents education um, about the role that they can play, and um, having parents learn that their children's anxiety is like a dog begging for food only, it's begging for attention and avoidance. And the paradox of this is that it might be very, very tempting for any good parent, and the research shows that 99% of parents get this wrong, is to say, okay, well, this dog is, is ruining my dinner, here's a big piece of my steak, now go away and never beg again. When we know that by doing that, the dog will come back and just beg louder and longer. And so the paradox of this is giving parents the education that we don't want kids to avoid their emotions as a way to cope with them. We want them to be able to coach themselves through it and to persist in the presence of distress rather than by using avoidance because avoidance fires the best teacher we'll ever have, which is our experience that would have told us that we could do that thing we didn't think we could do or that while our fear was real, the danger never was. That's number one. Number two is for parents to model self-care that it is really, really important and incredibly helpful for parents to cope out loud, is what I call it, and being able to talk about what they are doing to seek balance in their lives, how they are working to take good care of themselves. And by doing that, they will educate their, um, their kids that they also are worth being taken care of by themselves. And so modeling self-care is, is the highest importance for parents to use right now. And the third one, is what we call loving firmness, which is um, that we care too much about these kids to be complicit with their, their avoidance of their emotions. And so we're going to warmly expect them to um, not to get all A's or anything like that. We, we rail against that, but more about the idea that you can be anxious and something at the same time, that you can be brave at the same time. And so having lovingly firm expectations for kids to give them that, that high degree of structure that we know they thrive within. Okay. Um, uh, those were awesome. Um, my perspective is actually a little, a little different in that 
uh, Marie, when you asked how the schools can communicate with the parents about what supports, well, I think that um, a big thing that the staff of schools can do is encourage uh, one another to maintain patience with parents and um, try to eliminate some assumptions that we as educators might have uh, toward parents. I think that sometimes we, you know, jump to the conclusion that parents don't care about whether or not their child is, you know, uh, coping or not coping or finishing their homework or not. We kind of jump to those, those uh, conclusions because of our own stressors and expectations that we're under. And so I can really encourage um, staff to uh, maintain that patience and try to better understand through uh, over communication. So I always say that I, I want to as a parent, I always want to be communicated with to like a very annoying level. Like I want to be rolling my eyes at, at the information that I am getting from my students or my kids' teachers, right? The more information that we as educators can give to parents, the better. Um, uh, and I just mean communication about expectations, um, especially if we're working with students, if we are moving back into virtual environments, recognizing that parents are serving serving in a role that many of them have never served in before as a uh, uh, education partner and education teacher. And so, um, uh, you know, they may not know um, just the bare basics of, of what you do every single day. And so I'm um, really over communicating that. And I love how Sarah's talked about, you know, setting the picture of what does this look like? Well, as, as an educator, if I'm communicating with a parent, well, what does this expectation look like? Um, if I want this child to, um, you know, do this activity or practice this work, um, what does that look like? And uh, giving the parents the support because, you know, a very stressed parent will turn into a very stressed child. And uh, as much as we can do to um, help uh, uh, that comfort level and help that communication and connection between me as the educator or administrator and the student or the the parents. Um, one other thing I, I like to talk about when it comes to connection with family and schools is remembering that many of us may have to repair some bridges that we didn't burn. Um, recognizing that sometimes parents uh, were deeply hurt within the school environment themselves as children. And sometimes even in the same district, <laughs> sometimes even in the same building, and sometimes even by the same people that their children are now working with every day. And so recognizing that if, um, you know, a parent is resistant to, uh, you know, communicating or responding that there might be something there that, um, that happened before you came around and how we can build that relationship. Because, you know, I can tell a I've got great strategies that families can do. One that I love is uh, I play high, low Buffalo with students where, you know, every day we, at the end of the day and my own children too, you know, we talk about the high of our day, the low of our day and the Buffalo, which tends to be kind of like the wild card, the silliest, funniest, craziest, mm -hmm. most surprising thing. Um, something that like that, adding that into the routine can be helpful. Um, you know, nighttime meditation I do with my own kids. There's plenty of apps that allow that, um, that have lots of videos that you can recommend. But um, if that parent doesn't yet have that really great relationship with me as the educator, I might not as a parent take that recommendation. So if, um, if you feel like you're not quite close yet with that parent, uh, reaching in, letting go of assumptions, um, maintaining patience and being clear about my expectations, and then offering those really great suggestions for some calming activities and, and connection activities at home. Great suggestions. During, during the pandemic, we know that schools did shift um, to remote learning. We have schools that are still moving in and out of remote learning. Kids are having a greater, and schools are having a greater reliance on the use of Zoom. I mean, this, this webinar in itself probably wouldn't have taken place a couple of years ago. A lot is going on in terms of online learning and virtual learning and the delivery of lessons. What concerns do you have regarding the increased use of screen time on children's social emotional learning? And, and what can we do to mitigate that in terms of the design of activities in classrooms um, 
to, uh, to help create some greater balance. Go Sarah, ahead, you Jonathan, look like I'll you want you to start in. talking. <laughs> um, okay, so I'll, I'll jump in. So for me, um, kind of piggybacking on, on what Sarah was saying before, um, that executive functioning is just so much more challenging. Um, there's so many more distractions for that. Um, and the kids who have acronyms like ASD or ADHD or those kinds of challenges are going to find it much, much more challenging to be able to stay focused in that environment. Um, but in addition to that, there's that sense of loss of connection, um, that you are in your silo, you're in your own shared you know, space, you're sharing it, but not really in that way. Um, and so hopefully as we're shifting right now, it'll be very short term um, compared to where it was before. And so I think being able to contextualize that is important. Um, for the kids who have challenges and they're watching themselves struggle, this is the way I often describe it to them. Um, I have a picture when I give my presentations of a guy who drove his Ferrari on the beach and to surprise no one, it got stuck. I think the guy should be forever barred from owning Ferraris. And, <laughs> um, and he's sitting there with a shovel trying to dig it out of, of this beach. And then I have the picture of the same kind of car, but on a racetrack. And I'll say, you know, these two cars here, they have the same engine, they have the same horsepower, the same suspension, the same beauty. The difference is that it's being asked to do something it was never designed to do. And so what kids often lack, I mean, adults lack this as often as well, is context to understand the role the environment's playing with them. And so helping them to really establish a positive view of themselves as efficacious individuals who can accomplish the goals they're looking for, and really being able to contextualize these challenges that, of course, this is hard for you. Um, I liken it also to people 100 years ago who were left-handed, who were told to use right-handed right -handed scissors or to write right-handed, and they wonder why they have bad penmanship, um, that it really is the situation and the lack of accommodations for the way their brain learns that is really important for this. In terms of what schools can do, that's a tough one because there are so many constraints placed right now with staffing levels, with all kinds of things that we know are problematic. But I think being able to use coping self-statements. Um, so like, for instance, I know I can do hard things because, and having kids fill in the, the rest of that sentence in that way, or I'm stronger than my fear, or frustration is the birthplace of creativity. Helping kids to be able to have the language to coach themselves through the powerful emotions they may feel when they find themselves being distracted or kind of their mind wandering off and they have no idea what was just said in, a minute ago. Um, I, I love the idea of having um, individual check-ins kind of like office hours um, but having kids come in and break out groups to meet with the teachers independently while other people are doing asynchronous work to make sure that not just the kids have to reach out for the help, but to have teachers be able to check for comprehension in a small group setting, because so many of the kids that I work with would never ever reach out to a teacher online to ask a question, um, and it's so hard to check for comprehension in a Zoom classroom. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think there's a couple of things too that I see is that that whole self-regulation, um, especially when I'm doing telepractice with kids or when I'm watching teachers, you can really tell the students that have 82 tabs open and they're kind of jumping from tab to tab and then maybe they're bringing their focus back. Um, and similarly, when kids go to sit down to do homework, what we're finding is, is that um, they're really spreading their attention across um, favorite websites and those kinds of things. So I, I really also think teaching students some of those self-regulatory tools for online learning um, and for teachers to support students in learning those. So sometimes um, even one of the most simplistic things that you can do is have students learn how to open up two browser windows so that one browser window is dedicated to the things that are for education. So it can be your Zoom classes, it can be the research that you're doing, et cetera, and have a separate window open that has your favorite fun things like Pinterest and Roblox and whatever it is. And the rationale behind that in some ways is, is that you and I, when we're in a physical environment, we clean off our desk space to sort of improve our focus. So if I'm going to sit down and write a report, I might clean off my desk to kind of clear away the distractions to improve my focus. It's sort of like 
clearing away one desktop of distraction, only having one there. Um, teaching students how to use some apps like the Forest app is a really great app where um, students actively choose a period of time that they want to focus on a specific application. And it sort of helps them regulate not accessing other um, uh, lesser preferred sites like say uh, ESPN or Pinterest or you know Instagram or something when they're doing work. But the thing is, is that you're teaching the students themselves to utilize those types of self-regulatory tools so that they see the value of having a more focused period of time. And it kind of gamifies focus in a, in a positive way. Um, and I think the, the other thing that is um, super important about technology, um, which is sort of a, a silly thing, but I think it's really important, is that so many kids that are doing their reading online or they're reading on a Kindle or they're you know reading on a device like this, the challenge is, is that it's giving them that mental imagination and it's giving them imagery and it's impacting our students' ability to independently create imagery, which they need for both executive function and reading. And so I think working with students a lot to be able to ask them and be talking about what does it make you picture being able to provide images um, that help them grab context for reading and things like that um, will also improve both sort of that um, regulation as well as those executive function based skills. Thank you. Um, so uh, when I'm thinking about, you know, the remote learning and and everything uh, that comes with uh, kind of screen time and all of that. I think I first thought, you know, about this from an uh, an individual child's point of view and and really recognizing that um, the difference between how and how much um, that uh, and talking about balance with young people that, uh, you know, it's not so much about um, you know, how much time am I spending doing, you know, dot, 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 um, uh, you know, on Instagram or on, you know, TikTok. It's, it's really looking at how do I regulate and begin to manage my own screen time based on what way I'm engaging with it. So, um, you know, if I am, you know, using, uh, you know, playing Minecraft while also on, you know, mess Facebook Messenger talking to my friends, then I'm, I'm actually doing something that's going to benefit me in that I am creating social interactions with my friends and I'm getting all of this really great, um, you know, conversations and strategy work with my friends um, versus if I'm just spending an hour on Minecraft by myself, right? So, instead of kind of when I'm looking at screen time, uh, you know, restrictions, how are we looking at it from a, a, a how perspective? How am I using this social media? How am I using my screen time versus just how much? Because an hour doing, you know, or just scrolling TikToks is very different than an hour working with my sibling and creating a TikTok video, right? That those things are, are both utilizing the screen, but in different ways. Um, um, and so how can I balance that time? But I also, um, as both Sarah and Jonathan were talking, beginning to think about um, as some of our buildings are moving back into digital environments, remembering that, um, you know, our school staff is, I mean, pure experts at cooperative learning, right? Learning how to get kids to work together and to create those connections and create those teams. And I think when everything went virtual, that kind of all went up in the air because we were kind of like, how are we going to do this now? Right. Well, OK, I can't do this in the cooperative way I would normally do it. So I'm just going to have it do have them do this activity by themselves. Right. Where um, I have found a lot of teachers have really um, connected with kind of stretching their own minds of what this could look like cooperatively while still maintaining social distance or still maintaining our virtual environment. So maybe I can't do that um, lesson cooperatively in the way that that I would have in, you know, 2018, but how could I continue to do it cooperatively um, now? And um, as Jonathan said, maybe we do an interactive breakout. Maybe we do, um, you know, as Sarah was saying, utilizing apps, things like um, uh, 
Kahoot and Quizlet that allow kids, even though they're virtual, they're still working in teams and even competing against one another. I've seen teachers do, um, you know, cooperative uh, uh, narrative where their creative writing is cooperative, kind of like telephone, right? I make a I write a paragraph, now you write a paragraph, now you write a paragraph. Um, you know, I even saw uh, an art teacher who created um, a, a project outside of the school where kids could come and um, paint on the sidewalks and they had to connect to the sidewalk next to them. So it wasn't just my own sidewalk piece that I could do. So uh, really getting creative on ways that we can work together while maintaining um, that um, that social distance and digital learning. Um, and then the last thing is when I am utilizing lecture um, to try and be as interactive as possible, mm -hmm. there are um, some really great programs out there. The one that I personally use is called AHA Slides, um, like AHA, A-H-A Slides, which allow for um, uh, that regular interactive um, work that you're doing, particularly with some of our older students. So, um, so yeah, um, having kids think about how versus how much and balance cooperative learning and, and interactive, even though we have to be apart. Very good. Well, we're going to move into some questions that have been posed. Um, I do have one that really focuses on how are we um, working differently to support uh, the needs of our minority children, in particular, our children of color and some of the additional stressors they may be facing um, during this time. So I can jump in there. This has been a, a large priority of our practice, um, working with consultants, trying to build up these skills. So this has been something we've been learning a lot about. Um, so we, we refer to them as, as ri people with rising identities. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to um, say the words out loud, um, to talk about these things, to make these, these issues not be something that, that we're afraid to mention, if it's a black student or if it's a trans student. Um, we know that the racial reckoning going on, um, I, I, I've heard this, this quote before that we're not all in the same boat, we're all in the same water, but some of us have rowboats and some of us have cruise ships. And I think it's really important to be able to understand the role that identity plays in this. And so number one is just making it something that we can talk about um, and making it something that's mentionable because nothing that, that is not mentionable can be manageable to rephrase what Mr. Rogers once said. Um, Number two is to understand that um, many people of color are deeply traumatized over the last year and a half. And trauma-informed education is a really, really important um, thing for us all to understand, that it can come out in all kinds of different ways, from lack of concentration, to oppositionality, to irritability, to absenteeism. And so to really understand that, um, and I think the Surgeon General recently has talked about this, that, that racism is, um, is a mental health crisis. Um, and to understand the, the role that, that um, things like systemic racism plays um, and to understand the, the, the long-term cultural transmission of trauma um, is even through multi-generations is really important for us to understand um, and to be able to use a trauma-informed um, approach to that. I will say as an aside, the research shows that working with people um, who identify as trans, that using preferred pronouns or using preferred names can decrease depression symptoms by 70% and can decrease suicide attempts by 60%. Um, and so those are, are just, you know, easy, if you can save a life by using a word, it's one of the most important things that we can do. I, I can hop in. Um, um, sorry, I was just writing that statistic down. Um, uh, so when I'm thinking about um, working with students, um, uh, I think about making sure that we are talking with the families about what their needs are. I think that um, students of color, students with disabilities, um, you know, our um, LGBTQ plus um, student population um, are all different and have all different needs based on what communities that they're in and, and really talking with families based on what we believe, um, uh, you know, what we believe uh, can help them and how what they think they that we could do that would help them, um, whether that be through positive 
access, um, uh, uh, better communication, uh, better ways of providing things like transportation or extra types of tech support or educational support. Um, I think kind of uh, breaking away from assumptions of what we think they need and um, just really asking families what they need um, to bridge some of those barriers. But I also think um, that uh, thinking about what Jonathan said, that it brings up for me um, the huge gap in disproportionate discipline for particularly students of color mm -hmm. at school. And um, and so I, I know that this gap is increasing in our schools because of the pandemic. And when we think about, you know, we've probably all seen that meme of, you know, if a student's in fifth grade, the last, you know, normal year they were in school was second grade. And so when we as the adults in the building have uh, expectations that I'm going to have a fifth grader walk in the building, both behaviorally, socially, and classroom expectation wise, um, that expectation might not be realistic. And what we recognize is that when me as the adult, if, if I as the teacher, if my expectations aren't met, um, then that is is going to more often than not disproportionately impact young students of color in regard to the way that they are corrected or disciplined. And so I think recognizing from, uh, from the adult point of view that, um, that students' behaviors are going to be different, the expectations of what we may have thought was going to be any student coming into fifth grade, coming into 10th grade, coming into first grade. Um, it's, not, it's not a fifth grader coming in. It's not the same. And so uh, remembering that now as the adult, as Sarah said earlier, we have to re reteach those things as if it were a second grader in my class and not a fifth grader. And that's all kids, um, not any of our kids who are, uh, uh, you know, disproportionately treated, but um, recognizing then that when we are seeking what we would consider our typical consequences, recognizing that um, that that my bias can disproportionately affect students, particularly of color, and how I can begin checking in on that with myself so that um, I'm trying to be as equitable as possible in the supports that I'm giving both to the students and the families and um, recognizing that maybe this, uh, this behavior that I'm seeing isn't something that needs disciplined, it's just something that needs retaught. Um, so I think that's all. <laughs> Sarah? Uh, yeah, I, I think I would just pair it back what uh, both Jonathan and Missy said, um, mm -hmm. really that trauma-informed and understanding that there is this gap in academic and executive development. And so I think that if we have certain expectations of the student will go home and write a paragraph uh, for a homework assignment, well, if a student in a classroom can't independently write a paragraph, um, then that's not a realistic expectation uh, for homework. And so I think it's really being able to understand where students are at academically and providing them with the supports and interventions that they need to in order to be able to do some of those tasks more independently and to uh, really build their self-esteem and sense of competency and being able to do those things. Um, and I think that oftentimes I see so many times that we, uh, even from just a pure communication, I don't think we've talked a lot about that. So many kids that are learning in the classroom where the masks are there, they are missing a lot of directions. They are missing a lot of instruction and it is difficult to hear. Um, and so I find that um, it's okay at this point to be supporting students in really repeating directions, understanding that they might need more support in breaking down that homework, that they may, that they may need to reach out to the teacher and get clarification, um, as opposed to, well, you should have known what that homework was at school. Um, and so making sure that we're recognizing that those communication and barriers are, are present in school and we need to support them at home. Very good. One of our attendees has, um, has posted a question, um, really going back to Missy, something that you said and making a great point about being patient with parents and understanding the role they play as an educational partner, um, that that has changed dramatically. Um, in addition to communication and mindset, um, can you talk about the, the uh, value um, 
uh, that is added from tactics uh, that uh, could be useful for parents um, in collaborating with us, in particular, those parents that are super stressed. You know, we have some families that um, something that would be a normal, easy ask during different times is now an ask that is not reasonable. So how do we help those super stressed parents who, if in my head, I think about Maslow's hierarchy are really functioning at a very, very basic level. Um, and, and how might we, um, it, we talk a lot at our ESC about giving grace and really being understanding and empathetic regarding uh, the, the, the place and the position parents are in. Can you speak to that a little bit? I will. And I'm actually going to also mention something else mentioned in that question um, about the super stressed staff. So, um, you know, I think that, uh, that to me is the first step, right? That we really need to look at our staff and how we can better support the stress that our staff are experiencing. Um, one of the ways to do this is really looking at universal needs. And so, you know, I utilize um, uh, the PBIS multi-tiered systems of support mm -hmm. And, um, and so when we're looking at that, you know, the universal needs at the bottom, and I always think about that in regard to what our staff need. And so, um, you know, what is, uh, you know, what are the things that all of our staff members are entitled to, you know, lunch, um, to be respected, to feel like they have, um, you know, uh, all their materials and, um, you know, goodness that they get a pee break when they have to go to the bathroom, right, you know? And so when we're, we're looking at our staff as a whole, if, if I could see that, hey, there are a handful of teachers that are not drinking any water because they don't get a single potty break all day, um, that's going to need to be something that we can talk about as a staff. How can we um, rectify that? We need to make sure that our staff are, um, you know, going to the bathroom for goodness sakes, but we also need to make sure that they're, they're feeling less stressed because if I'm a stressed teacher and I'm trying to communicate with a stressed parent, that's going to be a stressful conversation. So how can I make sure that um, not just me as an individual teacher, that I'm taking care of myself, but how can I as a school staff look at ways of teaming up together and supporting one another. I have staff members, I've met staff member, teachers from all over, but I've been working recently with one um, inner city alternative school. And um, it's been so awesome to see them work because they are working with students who have the highest need, right? Students who have been expelled from other buildings. And, and these are with the highest needs, the most you know difficult behaviors. But these folks, they come into these meetings and they're smiling and they're laughing. And I say, what is it? And they say, there's nothing that um, helps me more more than the support of the people in this room, that the team is so close and feels so well supported by one another that they're able to overcome some of these really difficult situations. And so, you know, and they tell me they're giving each other potty breaks and they're, you know, having lunch accountability time where they're sitting together and having lunch together and they're giving each other permission to take breaks. Oh, you're on your break. I'll come back later, right? That they're giving that permission for them to be feeling supported. Um, and then how does that translate over into the way that I communicate with parents? And as you said, Marie, giving grace and giving patience. But um, other things that can help is, again, asking families what they need um, instead of making assumptions of what I need from them. Um, you know, they are our clients. And so how can I meet their needs in a way that might look different? Um, uh, you know, things like, uh, here are the, you know, four things that need done this week. Um, what are, uh, you know, you as a family can choose the best day that it gets done, right? Maybe you can't do anything on Tuesday night, but maybe we can do it on Thursday night, right? So giving families that choice um, and voice is what it's going to look like for them, I think can be very helpful as well. Very good. Anyone else? Um, you know, I'll, I'll just give like a super, super easy little trick. Um, I always believe fun, easy strategies are good. I think one of the things that um, ar around like planning and, and having kids be able to carry out routines and those things, um, 
typically so many times as parents and as educators, we give kids um, verbal directives, um, pack your bag, go brush your teeth, make your bed, um, you know, clean up the kitchen, all of those things, you know, set the table, whatever it might be, um, you know, uh, turn in your homework. The problem is, is that the minute as parents were the, and educators were the ones that say, brush your teeth, make your bed, clean off the table, do that we're actually the ones that are picturing it. And so a really super easy trick for stressed parents is to turn a directive into a job. And we call this job talk. And you just put er on the end. So instead of saying, go brush your teeth, we say, hey, could you go be a toothbrusher? Or instead of saying, pack your bag, hey, could you be a bag packer? And it's a little easy trick, but it actually has a big impact because students immediately have to picture, oh, well, what does a bag packer look like? What does a bed maker look like? And so in terms of super stressed parents and super stressed educators, just that teeny tiny, really easy trick and change in language actually has a big impact um, on supporting students in having to own their own self-directed talk towards, oh, well, if I do need to be a table setter, what do I need to do? Or if I do need to be a homework recorder, what, what should I do? you know, how do I go about that? So we're finding that it just helps as an easy trick for super stressed parents. Very good. Well, we are, we're coming to the end of our time. I, I just want to make one, one comment relative to your thoughts. Um, I think the, the role of routines is really important. And we've spent a lot of time working with super stressed parents on figuring out what are some effective routines where where kiddos can take some control over um, managing their, their piece of responsibility in, in getting done what needs to get done. But um, I, um, I, I don't see any additional questions in the box here. I will just take a, a minute here for you to go round robin. And if there's a nugget or a piece of information you wanna leave us with, if you wouldn't mind just sharing that. I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, I think that, and the research bears this out, that one of the most important things for a kid to develop is a sense of self-efficacy, which means how effective they believe they can be in meeting the demands of their environment. And so I think of this story, and I share this, this little nugget with a lot of, of people that I work with. So imagine there's a bird on a branch, and it looks over and sees there's a crack in the branch that it's standing on. Is the bird unafraid because it can think of all the reasons why the branch is strong and unlikely to break? Or is the bird unafraid because it knows it can fly? Knowing you can fly is self-efficacy. Knowing you're gonna be okay, not because the bad or hard thing isn't gonna happen, but you're gonna be okay because you can handle bad and hard things. In my mind, that is the essential message the pandemic has taught us. Um, and the more that we can harness that and give that skill that knowledge base, that self insight for the kids, the better it's going to be. Very good, very good, Missy. You look like you want to jump in there. Yeah, Give no, that I look was, on your face. <laughs> no, I just really you like have that. a nugget to um, a nugget to leave us with. I think for me, um, uh, I know that the stress is high, both in education and as a parent. And for me, I think that uh, that at the end of the day. I uh, try to really focus on the ways that I can be connected with students and how I can be connected with my kids at home and in what ways we can have fun together with my students and have fun together with kids at home. Um, you know, that way I'm recognizing that, yeah, this has been a hard time, but there's so many great things that have come from this. And remembering that um, that that connection is going to help all of the other things down the road too. Um, that uh, you know we can get through anything together. And quickly, Sarah. Yeah, I think that connection, especially at home, where students have the opportunity without masks to talk with family members and be you know building some of that um, language comprehension from nonverbal language and those things. And I also think just really remembering as um, educators and and providers that you know certainly um, executive function, social emotional is something that everybody does. It's not limited to certain populations, and that we are really seeing that very true um, developmental gap and delay because kids have not had a normal school experience. And so really meeting kids where they're at and understanding that um, we can't have um, high expectations so that kids 
don't feel that they can meet those expectations, as Jonathan was saying, and to um, understand where they are at developmentally and then teach them the skills that they need to begin to close that gap. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for this informative discussion. We've reached the end of the panel discussion and um, we um, very much appreciate your time, your expertise and, uh, and what you've conveyed today. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank Take care. You. This is wonderful.